Well, good morning once again. Hey, let's thank our band this morning for all the help. I didn't know Nick wasn't here until I turned around and looked. I didn't even know he was missing this morning. Y'all did a great job. We really appreciate that. Everybody getting ready for the holidays. You know, this is a, a great time of the year. Probably one of my most favorite times of the year, except for the time change. I, my wife loves the time change, and I don't like it. It gets dark too early. It takes into our fishing time. It just doesn't work. Because I'm not, I'm not a get up early person. I'm a stay out late person. So it didn't work with me very good. You know, with Thanksgiving so near to us right now, have any of you taken the time to reflect on what you're thankful for? Maybe what's most important in your life. This is a great time of year to do that. We should do that all the time. But just take the time to really reflect on what we're most thankful for. You know, if you had a fire that destroyed everything you own, and you could have saved a few things, what would you have saved? Ever consider that? There are some families here today who can relate to that question better than others, because they've had real-life experience in this area where they've had a fire in their home and it's destroyed everything. So they can tell you a little bit more about it if you've never been in that situation. And some people might say, well, I would have saved my TV my clothes, my furniture, or maybe my favorite appliance. I would have saved that. Most would likely say, though, they would say that they would have made sure that their loved ones were safe first. After that would probably be something about certain people and memories, such as pictures, maybe rings, papers, mementos, you know, things that were really important to them that basically couldn't be replaced. And these type things probably represented a person in their lives, a family member, or a relationship they had. They might tell a story of that person's life and their relationship with them. So that, that was very valuable to them. You know, everything else is replaceable. If you think about that, everything else is replaceable. But some of those little mementos, some of those little pictures, those little things that impacted our lives or have great memories in our lives, they're, they're probably some of the things we would want to hang on to more than anything else. I think I'd move my bass boat out of the garage first. <laughs> then we'd worry about everything else, right? That's not good, is it? There are some things we would save that can be considered not replaceable. There are some things in our lives that we consider of great value above all else. We might consider some of the things in our lives priceless. More valuable than the things the world would normally consider valuable, such as diamonds or gold or silver. We tend to protect these things with great value. This morning, I looked on the internet and one ounce of gold was worth $1,870.95 this morning. And that changes day to day. One ounce of silver was brought $25.42. And one ounce of platinum was worth $1,097.95. All of these are considered precious metals that people wish to possess. They wish they had some of that. Gold was one precious metal that drove people to pack up everything that they had and move to California. After when the gold rush started and finding just one, just one gold rock could make them rich overnight. They considered that their most prized possession if they found it, but they also lost their minds, their lives and everything else trying to find it for that one precious stone. At that time, even today, people consider gold to be the most precious thing they could own. But the Bible tells us that all worldly things are not the most precious things we need to own. According to God's word, the most precious thing we can possess is Jesus Christ in our hearts. The most precious thing we can possess so we're going to open up our Bibles this morning. We're going to be in Psalms, chapter 19, beginning at verse 7, if you join me there. If you have your Bible with you today, hold it up for me. 
You have your Bible today? Oh, that's great. Look at all the Bibles here. That's great. We should have our Bibles. But some of it do. Some of you do it. I know you do it on your iPhone because you can you can get there quicker. Because I talk a little too fast. But it's great that you're looking into God's Word. That you look at His Word and we take His Word, not mine, because these are His words we're going to use. We're going to be in Psalms, chapter 19, begin at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The status of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The degrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, that much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. So basically, the Bible's telling us right here in Psalms, and this is David, King David speaking, that this right here, we're to understand that God's word and God's commands are more precious than any gold that's out there, any precious stone of any kind. King David, who was the psalmist here, he imagined the most precious thing and the most costly thing of his day. Gold, not just any gold, but a lot of very pure gold, he considered the value of it. He was saying in Psalms that even though it's true that gold is precious, it's something that is desired, yearned for, longed for, and very valuable. The Word of God is still more precious than anything else. He's stating that, and he had it all. The reward of keeping the Word of God is not a wage, but it's a gift, right? If we keep God's Word in our heart. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, the most valuable things we have when we leave this earth, we're not taking them with us. But when we have Jesus Christ in our heart, we're promised. Remember that. We're promised a life after this life. Eternal life. Jesus warned about storing up possessions here on earth. And what we would gain by doing so. There's no need to do it because you're not taking it with you. Jesus shared in Matthew 6 uh, verse 19 by saying, turn with me there if you would. Let's look at it together. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, that's a key line in there. Where your treasure is, is where your heart will be also. Whether it's in your, you know, it's, whether it's in your horses, you know, it's in your bass boat, it's in your trailers, it's in your truck. Wherever your heart is continually at, I mean, wherever your treasure is continually at, that's where your heart's going to be. So you have to be careful about treasures that you store and you take them as the prized possession. I've said before, people that own a new pickup truck, we want to protect them or a new car. We don't want anything to happen to them, but when we park them somewhere and they get the least little scratch on them, we lose our ever-loving mind. We do. And it's okay to want nice stuff, but you have to consider that can be fixed. You know, we get, we get angry. We get upset about things. You know, I'm not exempt from that. Uh, Terry and I talked about that this week. I've had some things going on in my life, and, you know, that's uh, been some changes that I'm not used to and stuff, and it makes me angry. And I've got to be able to give it to God. If I tell, stand up here and tell you God's word says we've got to give it to him, then I've got to be able to do it also. And you know what? I've done it a little bit. And then I did it a little bit more. And then I think about it and I just take it all back and I get all angry all over again. I have to start all the way over, right? So I'm not exempt. Neither of any of us here. It's, it's just something that you have to continually to rebuke the devil because he's going to keep trying to stir it up. 
And you just have to continue to do that. And you have to pray about it a lot. And as my wife says, we have to stay in God's word. We've got to know what God says we need to do about it. Now, I can read and I know what God's word tells me about being angry about things and being upset about things and all that. I know what his word says. But if I don't continually read it and I don't continue burying it in my heart, then it's not doing me any good. I can know it, but I'm not living it, right? And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to live his word in our heart. To keep God's word, to keep his word involves meditating and hiding God's word away in our hearts. Making sure it stays there. It means we must not neglect it and we, we must obey it. His word. Now, that's, those are tough things. You know, most of us can neglect it. That's pretty easy to do. But the big thing is, is trying to obey it. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to obey his commands. People say, well, they don't apply today. That's from a long time ago. No, they don't. They're still the same today as they were back then. Oh, they're harder to keep nowadays. No, they're not. They're not any harder to keep. People may push your buttons. You know, we all got that relative that we don't mind visiting, but we don't want to hang out with them, right? Or we can visit them a couple of times a year, but that's about it, right? We all got a, a relative like that. Anybody not? I want to see that perfect family. I, I... <laughs> our friend or our acquaintance or whatever. You've got them like that. But if we truly keep God's word in our heart, we're able to deal with those type of people and those type of things and everything that runs in our life a whole lot easier. And we're easy, it's easier for us to obey God's word when it's buried in our heart. It's called accountability. Whether your friends are holding you accountable or your Christian brothers and sisters, I assure you, when God's word is buried in your heart, he's holding you accountable. And you'll think about it. In embracing God's word and obeying and keeping it, we have the best possible reward we could ever have in our life. Our life, our treasure, our hope in Christ, and the glory we shall have when we are fully united with him in heaven, right? The best reward we can have, it's right there. So why aren't we storing up more treasures in heaven than we are on earth? You know, it's true that the word of God is truly more precious than gold. As the new American Bible, standard Bible says, more desirable than gold. The word of God, more desirable than gold. And we looked at it that way. Because if that is the case, then why would we need anyone to encourage us to read it, to study it, or to hear it preached? If it's more valuable than anything in your life, why isn't it first priority? Why do we have to encourage people to do that? Well, look at it this way. If someone laid a pile of money worth $1 million dollars, in front of any of you today and said, it's yours, do with it whatever you will, how much encouragement would you need to take it, use it, and spend it? Not very much. You know, sometimes we'd be a little very weary, there might be a string attached, but they're saying, no, it's yours, do whatever you want to with it. You wouldn't need any encouragement, not at all. Not at all. You would use it, and you'd spend it. Wouldn't we? Why don't we treat God's word there that way if it's more valuable than money itself? I'm sure it wouldn't take much to encourage you to do that, right? A friend once said to President Grant that Sumner, who was a liberal lawyer at the time, did not believe in the Bible. Of course, Sumner doesn't believe in the Bible, answered Grant. He didn't write it. Amen. Amen. The attitude of, my, of, of mine toward the Christian truth, however, justly or unjustly shared by this brilliant Senator Grant from New England, is typical of uh, many of those who vent their doubts loudly and boast that they do not accept anything the way other people do, but must have infallible proof. They want to see a miracle. They want you to prove that the Bible is, is truly God's word, inspired word. They want you to prove that God actually exists. I guess we have to say prove he doesn't because he's all around us, right? And through all the science, all the people that's tried, God cannot be disproved ever. There are some people who never believe in the Bible. 
And that's because they themselves do not write it. And they never will believe in it. That's just the way it is. So why is it we need to be encouraged and reminded to read our study Bibles so we can take advantage of the precious gift of God that he's given us in his word? Why do we need to be encouraged so much? Mainly because it just said we didn't write it. And people don't always agree with what it says. That's the kicker right there. We don't always agree or people don't always agree with what it says. And that's the fact because in James 1, uh, verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Oh, do what it says. Do you know I would not have to walk up here and bring a message to anyone on any Sunday if they would just do what it says, right? You wouldn't need me. you need God, but you wouldn't need me. You wouldn't need anybody. Do what it says. But the reason we can't do what it says is because we don't believe it. And we don't want to. We want to change it to fit our narrative. To fit what fits us, right? All the time. If we didn't like those parts, why don't we just tear those pages out of the Bible and skip over those and move on? That's why people don't pick up their Bibles at all. They don't read their Bibles because it's going to tell them something they don't want to hear. And that's the truth. Research shows that the majority of all born-again Christians read the Bible once or twice a week or not at all. Study shows that. According to one study, only 18% of all Christians said they read the Word every day. 18% of all Christians Read the word every day. Another 18% read the Bible between three and six days a week. And there were 37% that read it once or twice a week. And 20, 23% of Christians don't read the Bible at all. 23% of Christians don't read the Bible at all. So how can they know what God's word truly says to them? If they're not reading it, they're just coming on Sunday and hearing it. You know, they're hearing it from others, but they're not hearing it straight from God because that's his word. That's his inspired word. And you know where you fit in these statistics. So as we look at David's psalm this morning, he outlines to us why God's word is so precious and should be desired. And once again, think honestly before God where you fit in these statistics. How often do you read your Bible? How often do you open it? It's got a lot of dust on it. That could reveal something to you. Since God reveals himself to us through his word, shouldn't we believe that knowing God is the most important thing in our lives, the most precious thing in our lives? Gypsy Smith, a man named Gypsy Smith, told a man who said he had received no inspiration from the Bible although he had gone through it several times. He made that statement. I received no inspiration from the Bible, even though I have gone through it several times. The man replied, let it go through you once, replied Smith, and you will tell a different story. That's true. Let God's word be buried so deep in your heart that your story will be different. You know, there's not one person in here that doesn't have something in their past they wish they didn't have. You know, I heard Ben Carson speaking this week, and he was speaking to a bunch of church members, and he talked about that. He said, you know, people have skeletons in their closets. But he said, if we don't put any skeletons in our closet, then we don't have to worry about them coming back out. And he's talking about honesty. Are we being honest with ourselves? Are we hiding stuff? I don't care how many, how many things you hide in your closet. God knows what they are. And they're going to be revealed. And they're going to come to light. So do away with them. Give them to God. Let his grace and mercy take care of that, right? And move on. Stop putting skeletons in your closet. You get, I'm sure some of us got them bones full in there, right? Why are we keeping adding on? Because if you don't do that, you don't ever have to look back. We can keep looking forward. We don't have to worry about what's coming up from behind. One of the most dramatic examples of the Bible's divine ability to transform men and women involved the famous mutiny on the bounty. Following their rebellion against notorious Captain Bly, nine mutineers, along with the Tahitian men and women 
who accompanied him, found their way to Picarn Island, a tiny dot in the South Pacific, only two miles long and a mile wide. Ten years later, drinking and fighting left had left only one man alive, John Adams. Eleven women and 23 children made the rest of the island's population, but only one man. So far, this is a familiar story made famous in the book and the motion picture. But the rest of the story is even more remarkable. About this time, Adams came across the bounty Bible in the bottom of an old chest. He began to read it, and the divine power of God's word reached into, into his heart of that hardened murderer on a tiny volcanic speck in the vast Pacific Ocean and changed his life forever. The peace and love that Adams found in the Bible entirely replaced the old life of quarreling, brawling, and liquor. He began to teach the children from the Bible until every person on the island had experienced the same amazing change that he had found. Today, with a population of slightly less than 100 people, nearly every person on the island is a Christian. How powerful can the Bible be? You know, the Bible is a compilation of 66 books and letters written by more than 40 authors during a period of approximately 1,500 years. Sometimes it's referred to as the canon. But for Christians all over the world, the Bible is more than just a popular book. It is God's owner manual for life. Like any good owner's manual, the Bible gives us instructions. And Christians consult it from time to time when they need help. The Bible provides advice on how to solve problems of any kind. You get that? It will help you solve problems of any kind in your life. Love problems, problems at work, problems with the family, problems with friends, and so on. The Bible can help us solve any problem. Modern day Christians believe that the Bible they hold in their hands is just as profitable for every aspect of their lives as it is for a Christian way back in the first century. They believe it's that valuable today as they did back then. Many. The Bible contains the history, revelations, and prophecies of Christianity over a thousand years. And the Bible is the number one selling book of all time. That should tell us something right there. You know, of all the precious metals we've spoken of are basically rocks. You know, whether it's gold, it's silver, it's platinum, whatever, iron, copper, it's all rocks. Valuable rocks. And the value of these precious metals, they can change at any time. Because I watched that on the internet. You know, one day it would be one price, the next day it's another price, and it's up and down. So they can change at any time. But the value of Jesus Christ in our lives never changes. It's the same. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's never going to change. So his value to us is always worth the same. Jesus Christ is the unchanging solid rock in our ever-changing world. Solid rock, more solid than gold, more solid than silver, platinum, or anything else. He's the solid rock in our changing world. When you wake up tomorrow morning and hear the news that something has changed in this world, you can believe Jesus Christ will still be the same. Doesn't matter what changes in this world, he's still the same. So this morning... I'd pray that we review our priorities, what is most valuable in our lives, that we need to think about what are we truly thankful in our lives today. If you're here today, just be thankful. Amen? What is so precious and valuable in our lives that we should be thankful for? You can name many. And I've heard it said uh, so many. People shared so many different things with me, and I understand that. If we love those things so much that we have, including our kids, our family, and everything, should we not remember 
who provided them, where they came from. God gives and God takes away, amen? Make sure we're thanking the right person for the right things. And if it's not Jesus Christ that you're most thankful for, then I'd suggest you open your Bible and get into God's Word so you can learn and you can understand how valuable and precious the gift of God means to your life. I have seen as a pastor over 14 years now, so many lives changed, so many struggles in life, but the changes that were made when a person actually picks up God's word, reads it, and buries it in their heart. I've seen so many changes. I don't care how rough you are. I don't care how, you know, just how you don't agree with everybody. You know, you don't have to agree with everything. But what it says in the Bible, I'd suggest you agree with it all. Because it's God's divine word, right? Inspired word of God. There's so many times that we want to deal with things on our own. Me personally. Like I just talked about the anger. But if I go in and see what God's word says about anger, or about being upset about things that you actually have no control over, it helps calm me down. And it should you too. No matter what's going on in your life, it's a road map. It's a GPS. It's a, it's a, it's a life manual. And it's a love letter. Because God's word is nothing but love toward us. As long as we bury his, his love deep in our heart, his commands, and do what it says. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. We thank you for this just beautiful weather. Father, first of all, we're thankful for the baptism this morning, the rededication, Father. Lives start to change when that happens. Father, we're thankful for your word that's more precious than anything in our lives that you've given to us free, not costing us a thing. And Father, we're thankful that the value of your word will never change, that it remains the same. So Father, this morning, I know there's someone here that's struggling. They're struggling, uh, you know, with things going on in their lives. And Father, seeking some way to correct those. Maybe just trying to shove another skeleton in their closet. But Father, I pray that you would touch them, that they'd feel your presence, that they would begin to read your word and bury it in their heart, Father, that they would seek you and your owner's manual. Father, with the upcoming Thanksgiving, we are thankful. We're thankful for your love, your grace, and your mercy to show upon us. We're thankful we have the opportunity to come here and be in praise and worship to you. Father, I uh, we love you, we praise you, we give the glory to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen.